Hi, I'm Christina Lett, a certified wound specialist and an ostomy management specialist. I am the chief nursing officer for Wound Care Advantage and I am a WCU alumni. In this video, we're gonna talk about ostomies. Did you know that over 700,000 Americans have had ostomy surgeries? First, we're going to answer the question, what is an ostomy? An ostomy is a surgical procedure that involves the removal of diseased portions of the gastrointestinal or urinal system and creation of an artificial opening in the abdomen to allow for elimination of body waste. It can be made at almost any point in the gut. It may be temporary or permanent. It is an essential part of treatment for colorectal cancer, bladder cancer, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, birth defects, and other intestinal urinary medical conditions. Ostomies are considered necessary in certain cases of severe abdominal and or pelvic trauma. Doctors may also recommend a temporary stoma if all or part of your large intestine needs time to rest after surgery. To make an ostomy, the surgeon brings a portion of the colon through the abdominal wall. This opening in the abdomen is called a stoma. It is the most common transverse and sigmoid ostomy. A stoma is pink or red in color and is held in place by sutures. They are normally not painful themselves, but are highly vascular and can bleed easily. The three types of ostomies are colostomy, which is most common, an ileostomy, or a urostomy, which is the least common. And the two types of temporary stomas for eventual reattachment are loop and double barrel. When a patient has a colostomy stool, it no longer passes through the anus. It is eliminated through the ostomy, however, mucus can still be present. The ostomy becomes the actual intestine and does not have a sphincter muscle like the anus, therefore it causes no control. Okay, so we're gonna talk a quick review of the digestive system and the GI tract. The process of digestion begins at our mouth, where food is mechanically broken down into swallowable sizes. Once chewed, the food then travels down our esophagus and into our stomach. The stomach breaks down the food even further, producing acids and enzymes as it becomes a liquid form. From the stomach, it is slowly released into the small intestine, where the majority of digestion and absorption of nutrients take place. After traveling through the small intestine, any unabsorbed material will be eventually passed through the body. The small intestine is 20 feet in length and responsible for the majority of digestion. It is where vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats, and carbs are absorbed into your body. Anything that is not absorbed there enters the large colon as liquid waste or stool. The large intestine, also known as the colon, is five to six feet long and has two jobs, which are to absorb water and hold fecal matter, and is made up of four parts ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid. As stool moves through, more and more salt and electrolytes are absorbed. As the process of materials being broken down, eventually the stool will solidify and pass from the body as feces through the rectum and anus during a bowel movement. Ostomy output can vary. It typically starts as a liquid and then becomes formed as you resume a regular diet. Depending on the location of the stoma site will definitely indicate the type of output. Colostomy, depending on its location drainage, may be more formed. The further along the large intestine, the more formed the stool becomes. Ascending, located on the right side of the abdomen, effluent is high in volume with a liquid mush consistency. Transverse, located upper abdomen, either in the middle or towards the right side of the body, effluent is a paste-like soft substance. Descending, located left lower side of the abdomen, effluent is formed and solid. The sigmoid, located on the left lower side of the abdomen, few inches below descending ostomy, the effluent is formed and solid. Ileostomy that comes from the ileum, usually on the right lower abdomen. The effluent drainage is a loose liquid. It hasn't had time to pass through the large intestine, so there is no water absorption. An ileostomy is located on the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. The effluent is semi-liquid to soft, semi-fluid, paste-like consistency. So now we're gonna talk about the stoma assessment. It's a collection of data that characterizes the status of the stoma and the surrounding peristomal skin. Performed by inspection, looking, palpitation, touching, listening, and smelling. The assessment upon each appliance change or patient visit should be documented weekly at minimum. The purpose is to identify the signs and symptoms of complications and the foundation of product selection, so choosing the choice that we're gonna use which bag we're gonna place over the stoma. It's essential for tracking purposes that we make sure we document if the stoma is deteriorating or getting better. So now let's get into the frequency of assessment based upon care settings. So immediately after post-op, you're gonna wanna assess the stoma every four hours for 24 hours and then every eight hours as needed. Make sure you follow your facility's policy. 
For a matured stoma, these are the ideal characteristics. Moist, round, beefy red, budded shape. We like to joke and call it a rosebud. It should protrude two to three centimeters. Located on a smooth portion of the abdomen away from belt lines and bony prominences, suture lines, and the umbilicus. The lumen is in the center of the stoma. Adequate surface area is typically two to three inches from the flat surface surrounding the stoma. The location should be easily seen by the patient, and for mo many people, the best location is the lower quadrant. Sometimes stomas protrude. The height or protrusion of the stoma is important not only for proper drainage, but also to conceal the stoma. The protrusion varies in length and can slightly retract or extend throughout the life of the stoma. The stoma height should be measured at the mu mucotaneous junction where it attaches to the skin at the top of the stoma. A stoma can be flush, which is at skin level, moderately protruding, one to three centimeters, long protrusion, which is greater than three centimeters. It can be at greater risk for injury or trauma, laceration, or being folded or bent over into the pouching system. A retracted stoma is below the skin level. A prolapsed stoma is telescoped away from the abdominal surface. There are different stoma sizes and it varies on the anatomic location of the ostomy. An ileostomy will have a smaller stoma. The width of the small intestine is about 2.5 centimeters. A colostomy size varies as the width of the colon varies and therefore stoma sizes can vary. The colon can be anywhere from 2.5 centimeters at the small intestine junction up to 6.3 centimeters in the transverse colon. Loop stomas are larger than end stomas. Loop stomas are constructed with the side of the intestine rather than the end. Ureter ostomy is a small stoma as it is created from the ureters, which has a small diameter compared to the ileal conduit, which is created from the wider ileum. Round stomas are measured by circular diameter. Irregular or oval stomas are measured using the clock method for length and width. Let's talk about how to measure a stoma. For detailed documentation, you wanna make sure you measure length and width using the clock method. Consider stoma as a face of the clock. 12 o'clock points to the patient's head, six points stand to the patient's feet. So length would be 12 to six, which is the patient's head and feet, and width would be three to nine, which is side to side. Accurate measurements of the stoma are important to track the progress of the ostomy, but also to determine the correct size of the skin barrier and pouching system. Measurements should be done frequently during the first six to eight weeks of the post-op period with each application change. For appliant sizing measurement irregular stomas should be traced and a copy of the tracing should be recorded for appliance fitting. Use a piece of the plastic transparent material and place over the stoma. You may use the clear plastic packaging cover or paper backing from the skin barrier. Trace around the perimeter of the stoma onto a transparency with pen or indelible marker. Label tracing indicating location of head, feet, pouch size, and skin side. Stoma mucosa. So the color of the stoma mucosa is gonna be really important. Red and dark pink are a sign of a healthy stoma. Pale pink can mean a healthy urinary stoma, but in fecal stomas can mean anemia and low hemoglobin. Dark red or a purple tint can mean bruising. Black or brown can mean lack of blood supply or necrosis and should be alerted to the provider as soon as possible. The appearance of a stoma should be nice and shiny. If it looks taut, this can mean that the stoma is tight or stretched. If the stoma is edematous after post-op, then it's considered normal. It should decrease over six to eight weeks after surgery. The stoma is a mucous membrane and should always be moist with its own lubrication. The texture of the stoma can be smooth or textured with grooves and creases. We like to say it looks like a rosebud. You may see some superficial bleeding from the stoma during routine cleaning, which is normal. Stoma tissue is highly vascular, fragile, and does bleed occasionally. If the bleeding does not stop spontaneously, has excessive bleeding or prolonged bleeding, it may mean there is a complication of the stoma and the provider should be notified immediately. Luminal bleeding, which is bleeding that occurs from the lumen of the stoma, is often associated with an underlying disease. The clinician should always notify the surgeon regarding luminal bleeding. The stoma laceration means that it's been cut or torn. Make sure to take note if the stoma is limp, loose, or flabby. The shape of a stoma is round, oval, or irregular. The shape can vary with peristaltic movements of the intestine. There are different types of stomas. A stoma is created from one end of the bowel. The other portion of the bowel is either removed or sewn shut, also known as the Hartman's procedure. A loop stoma is one stoma with two openings. One discharges stool and the other one mucus. A double barrel stoma is two distinct stomas. One discharges stool and the second mucus. 
One stoma is usually called the proximal stoma, while the other is called the distal stoma. The proximal opening of the stoma drains stool from the intestine, while the distal opening of the stoma, the mucus fistula, drains mucus. A stoma lumen is the opening of which the effluent drains. It is centrally located and level with skin. Ideally, the lumen should empty from the top of the stoma. The location of the lumen should be noted using the clock method with the patient's head referenced as 12 o'clock position. Make sure to document the number of lumens and if there is stenosis present, which is the narrowing of the lumen. There are certain stoma complications that you should look out for. Stoma complications at the mucocutaneous junction include detached or separation and stenosis. Mucocutaneous detachment involves separation of the stoma from the peristomal skin. It can be partial or circumferential and results from problems with surgical stoma construction as secondary complication of retraction or necrosis. The area of mucocutaneous separation should be managed conservatively and focus on measures to support wound healing. You want to make sure you choose absorptive wound dressings in the presence of drainage and providing a flat pouching system that covers the area of separation, exposing only the stoma. Stenosis is the narrowing of the lumen of the stoma. Extreme narrowing may threaten normal stomal function, causing output of the effluent to decrease. The patient may have narrowing or ribbon-like stools, pain at the time of stoma emptying, and excessive explosive or high-pitched gas. Mild with minimal signs and symptoms, a low residual diet, stool softeners, and adequate hydration may facilitate the movement of soft stool through the bowel lumen. If the patient presents with signs and symptoms of partial stomal obstruction, a digital exam will determine severity. Make sure to alert the surgeon. Stomal lacerations are the result of poor pouching techniques such as a bag that does not fit properly. Lacerations clinically present as a yellow or white linear discoloration in the stomal mucosa or as an area of denuded deep red discoloration on the stoma that bleeds easily. You should use your visual senses to inspect the stoma con to confirm the diagnosis. So now we're gonna talk about how to change a stoma bag. First, you wanna wash your hands and don clean procedure gloves. Prepare the patient by lying the patient flat on the bed. Position the patient so that no skin folds occur along the line of the stoma. Expose the ostomy bag and provide clean towels under the bag. If the pouch is drainable, empty the existing ostomy contents. Dispose in an appropriate waste container. Remove the ostomy bag by gently removing the old wafer from the skin. Beginning at the top and proceeding in a downward direction, keeping the skin taut. At the same time, use the other hand to hold tension on the skin in the opposite direction of the pool. If resistance is encountered and the wafer is difficult to remove, use an adhesive remover. Dispose the old pouch and wafer in a plastic bag for disposal. If the pouch is non-drainable, dispose of it in its appropriate container. Use warm water and mild soap or a skin cleanser to cleanse the stoma and surrounding skin. Remove all old adhesive from skin using an adhesive remover if necessary. Gently pat the area dry. Inspect the stoma and peristomal skin. Document your stoma assessment. Measure the size of the stoma in the following way. Use a standard stoma measuring tool. Place over the stoma. Measure the stoma from side to side. Provide a clean gauze over the stomal site. Remove gloves and wash hands. Trace the size of the opening to the back of the new wafer. Cut the size of the opening 1 8 to 1 16 inch larger than the circumference of the stoma. Prepare the peristoma skin as needed. Make sure to name the different care products used in your documentation. Apply the wafer to the stomal site. Remove the paper off the wafer and warm the adhesive ring between hands to provide better adhesion. Center the wafer opening around the stoma and press down. If using a one-piece pouch, make sure the bag is pointed down towards the patient's feet. If using a two-piece system, place the wafer on first. When the seal is complete, attach the bag following the manufacturer's instructions. For open-ended pouches, fold the end of the pouch and clamp appropriately. Place the hand over the newly placed wafer to warm the adhesive ring. 
Patients can be asked to do this as well. Remove your gloves and wash your hands. Return the patient to a comfortable position. In summary, ostomy care may seem scary, but this surgery helps patients improve their quality of life by reducing the burden of their illness. Being able to bring comfort and education for these patients can make the world of difference.